Alright, so today I'm going to be looking at a number of things because it's been a while since I've streamed. Um, I know I already mentioned this, but I was injured and I had to cancel classes. Um, but hopefully I can get through everything um, as quickly as I usually do. Um, if I'm a little bit slower, I'm sorry. Okay, so this is a silhouette. What you have here is a silhouette. You have really, really strong uh, outdoor lighting, which is the strongest kind of lighting. Any version of light you know, sunlight is going to beat it. There's no other light that we know that we've ever recorded exposed to us, on us, stronger than sunlight. Sunlight is the, the highest level. So what we need to do is make sure that this sunlight that's right behind this character, we are in the dark side. We are in the eclipse of this character. We are underneath their shadow. We are within their shadow, meaning that they are the shadow. So what we do is we just get the next cool shade and we must darken them. And we darken them according to the color wash. And the color wash is a reflection of the surrounding environment. So if you've chosen a really, really dark blue wash over everything, then that's the value that this character will have. The higher we go, the closer we get to the light source, the darker the character will get. And this carries all the way around and the thighs, the geometric anatomy, oh, this is not easy, I'm telling you guys. The geometric anatomy of the thighs is a cylinder. And so that means that I'm darkening only around the thickest belt of the thighs. Do you see that? I'm not putting the shadow everywhere, just around the middle. This is super awkward. Um, and then the bone has less fat, a lot more bone, the knee. So I'm going to be putting, God damn it, I'm going to be putting some more shadow around there and then when we get to the fatty pockets again when we get to these fatty sections like the thighs or the calves subsurface scattering takes over now can anyone tell me why we don't see subsurface scattering up here why we see it down here around the thighs can anyone guess why subsurface scattering happens so low on the body even though up here is where most of the light is yeah stay on topic or else my mod will punish you <laughs> Is it realistic for a character to have glowing eyes while enveloped in shadow or silhouette like the wolf, or is it more of a stylistic choice? It's neither. It's 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 not realistic or stylistic. There's a reason why that character's eyes can glow. If you think about it physically, if you were you know you were designing an animatronic or something for a movie and it was a dark scene but the eyes had to glow, you would get light bulbs and put them behind the eyes. So you have to think about it in that respect. Don't think about it as a style or a narrative or magic. Don't say that it's because of magic, cause, because magic. Think of it as a physical thing. If you actually had that character enveloped in shadow and they had glowing eyes, they would glow every... That, uh, that light will bounce on the nose, bounce on the brow bones, on the lashes. So you think about it as if you really did create the realistic equivalent of that... Um, of that creature and you actually threw them in some shadow and turned on the light bulbs behind their eyes what would that light bulb do to the surrounding environment that's the only way to make it look realistic explain the magic the magic aspect is why their eyes are glowing to begin with um, and then uh, and then just go from there but but it's not stylistic it's not a stylistic reason technically speaking that the eyes are glowing in this way so uh, because it comes through like an eyeball the highlight is at the top and the light spot at the bottom there's more mass, reflected light, they reflect more volume at the top because there's a solid inner mass to block the light. Is it because the surface area is less dense? No, you can still get surface subsurface scattering up here. There's subsurface scattering available that we're going to do around the ears. But why is it that the subsurface scattering is visible down here? Because this light, if we look at it from the side, we have the, the standing monster. We have the light coming this way. Any object in front of a light source I can't even light source and uh, this is the object this is considered a silhouette but the lower we go the light comes in at an angle so this is no longer the shadow moving in here this is coming from the top and if you know subsurface scattering happens when it comes in at an angle in such a way and we're positioned in such a way where the light is not directly behind the object but a little bit above it like an x-ray moving down, revealing sitting on top, coming from above the flesh, not directly on top, not directly behind, but just from the top angle. And that's when we get subsurface scattering. So down here is when we're going to start seeing a lot of that subsurface scattering on the edges. Highlights. 
just around here. We're going to see some, some of that sub subsurface scattering because the light is coming in from the top. But anywhere, any situation where the light is coming directly from behind the object, it's a silhouette. This and this have the same density, but this gets subsurface scattering because the light is coming in from the top and sitting on top. It doesn't have a chance to create a silhouette yet. It's going right through the skin, getting trapped under the skin, and then going back down. And that's why we get to see the subsurface scattering and the rim light around this object before we see the silhouette. But up here we see the silhouette because the object is, again, directly in front of the light source. So let me go backward. I'm sorry I'm a little bit slow today in my process. I've got to erase these little pieces to continue. We do have subsurface scattering around the hair for another reason. Subsurface scattering happens on translucent objects. And what's translucent, what's light least dense, it automatically becomes susceptible to subsurface scattering. So the density in the ears, the cartilage or the lack of density in the ears causes a subsurface scattering around the ears. If there's blood under there, it'll illuminate orange or warm. The hair around this creature is very, you know, it's like a fur. So it's going to get lots and lots of subsurface scattering. Yeah, I overestimated my capabilities today. This is excruciating. <laughs> I mean, it's like an anti-inflammatory. I thought it might help, but it's like it more, the more it heals, the more it hurts. But I had to save those ten people from that terrorist with the katana and um, that terrorist n tiger ninja. I don't know how the story is developed lately. <laughs> so let's say before you thought that the light was glowing around him. The light always comes from one direction. Light doesn't just flow in from the ceiling. The, 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 this entire sky is not a light source. Remember that. The entire sky is also illuminated by one light source, and that's the light source of the sun. It always comes from one half of the horizon. It doesn't just fill the sky above us like a big glowing ceiling. It comes from one direction. And that light, we have to decide that it's coming from above. It's adding mystery to the character. And it, let me see what multiply does. No, I like dark and better. It adds mystery, and it uh, serves the cinematic purpose of the silhouette. And again, it keeps the intrigue in the front cover, so you don't want to reveal too much in the front cover, which is the rule of making any kind of cover design. Don't reveal too much about the character or their details. Keep them shrouded in darkness so that the person reads the book and is attracted to it and wants to answer the questions raised by the design. And then after that we have the Dodge color Dodge. I'm just going to grab the exact light source color around him. I'm not going to get a new color. I'm going to grab the exact situation around him, the light color, the that entire business and I'm gonna spike it higher because some of this light is trapped in here so it's gonna reach a higher contrast level around this character and you're gonna see one second what that does it's gonna be gorgeous and that's the benefit of working you know working with uh, form studies is it makes you aware of when this these exact situations happen so now the light source really sits underneath him, underneath the fur. Of course, this piece can't be as bright as the rest. We're getting further and further away from the light source's direction. And down here, we're going to have slight instances. We can't just spike it up again to be the height of contrast at the top of the character. It has to be a degree, a great fraction less. Oh, I don't know. Why didn't I have to... I have to go and injure my right hand. It's like the worst thing to injure. I can't wash dishes, and I, I love washing dishes. <laughs> I love cleaning. I, it's my life. It's my life force. If I don't clean the house, I, I don't do well in the day. I love cleaning my house because I, I don't know, it's like a, a little bit of art as well. Because I put a lot of, like, invested a lot of decor <laughs> design in my house, so cleaning it up feels like I'm also drawing. And when I can't clean it up, I just get so frustrated. So, before, after. Now the light source is really, really matching. One problem is that green, green sits between the warms and the blue, and, and the cools. It's probably the only color that does that. Uh, red kind of gets away with it because you've got like a purple red and a, um, and a uh, warm red. But any color, I guess, that's on either side of blue can be warm and cool. It's really crazy. And green is one of those colors. 
and green you're using a yellow green this green is way too close to the yellows my friend what you need to do is grab a green that's hinting from like a little bit leaning on the blues because that's the only way that we can have a green in this kind of light environment what came first is the light source the humidity level the fog and the light source on the sky and that down the, the, the ground didn't come first the sky did let's think of it like that before we added the earth we added the atmosphere and then we added the light source uh, and then we added the earth after that and then the colors thereafter the wash controls the visibility the temperature and the hue of all the colors write that back to me so color I'm gonna make this grass a more blue grass it's still gonna be grass but it's gonna be reflecting the light environment around it I'm also gonna desaturate it somewhat it's still gonna be grass but again it's coming out of this filtered uh, this this really blue environment this purpley almost environment All right, so before do you see that yellowy grass it didn't match so just because when you were a kid they gave you a green crayon to paint grass with you can go grab any green you want and get away with it the wash is really important in landscapes the wash is the most important thing in a landscape so we've got, let's talk focal points and composition. Um, we've got, let me first add the subsurface scattering. Sorry about that. The subsurface scattering, remember what, what the rule was for that one video I made about subsurface scattering? Illuminate and saturate. Those are the two ways to make subsurface scattering happen. We illuminate and we saturate. We choose the areas that are the least dense that the light is shining through. And then we grab either your sponge tool and saturate or you grab a color layer. <clears throat> color and then grab again the wash color or the color of its flesh I'm just gonna grab like a blue purple maybe a little bit more saturated than that and then just toss it on all the areas where that light has shown through to represent that subsurface scattering he isn't he's probably really bony without all that fur even more bony than we see him here and I'm gonna throw that around all the edges of this character to represent that subsurface scattering. There are a lot of areas that need to be darkened just a little bit more. Um, oops. So just around here. Darken. All right, illuminate and saturate. <clears throat> wash is like an overlaying color sort of determines temperature and tone of a piece yes it's also the, the the color of the air the color of the atmosphere it's not just a stylistic composition choice that helps you get started on your process this is a real really required like you know piece of equipment <laughs> you can't skip the wash when you're doing a landscape you have to decide is it going to be cool or is it going to be warm period Right, so just up here, I'm going to try to lasso. Just up here, I'm going to give the ears a little bit fudge, a little bit more um, detail because composition wise, the light is pointing to and revealing all of these little contours around the ears. And so we need a little bit more contrast and detail before I add in the subsurface scattering. So we need that extra little bit of detail. We're swinging between this focal point and this focal point. And then finally, it depends really how you want to, to where you want to take this character. If they have a cuteness to them, if there is like a, a level of cuteness to this character, we want to you know, show them to be soft, if this is like a Pete's Dragon type of deal. So we start with the base color if you want to saturate I mean show the subsurface scattering around the ears we choose the cool value that's going to be the skin and the flesh and the um, the blood that's visible underneath this translucent cartilage and then we lay it on and then we don't just do that we have to grab the color of the atmosphere that's being caught inside this translucent flesh and then we just um, combine those two values together. So if you didn't catch that, I'll upload the recording, but I I am I'm in a lot of pain. <laughs> I want to get through this. I got to get through this. Use the katana to cut the wolf's arms. Yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty lengthy story exactly how I got this injury, but 
I mean, you just got to look at these stitches. They're pretty badass. I mean, I had to have done something pretty badass. You don't just get these crazy stitches for no reason, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to not just leave it the same temperature all around. Some parts of the ear are more dense than the others, so the base of the ear gets less of that illumination. And at the very top, it gets really, really, really thin. And then, of course, we have the sum that, that actually gets through the ears and shines through the ear. Right? You guys cannot forget to paint the air paint the air. If you don't know what that means, I think it'll dawn on you, but um, typically what it means is that the air around the, the, the creation also has like this glow to it. The air also gets illuminated. I don't recommend you paint the eyes or the teeth. I recommend you think geometry. So what does that mean? That means the sides of the snout get some light on them, just some. And you have to make sure that you're keeping it a mysterious silhouette. You can't just... Uh, start bringing in all this detail. You have to let the geometry, illuminate the geom geometry before you bring in detail, portrait detail. The geometry comes first, always. Write that back to me. And if you're on YouTube, comment. Write it down as a comment. I would love seeing that. I'm going to flatten, grab my dodge tool, and just run a little bit more illumination around and when it comes to the fur, I don't think, unless the fur is wiry or something, we wouldn't be seeing this much detail in between the, the pieces. We would see a lot more of a plushy kind of blurred furnace. All right? Furnace. Now we, you cannot, because you chose a, a silhouette situation, you cannot bring illumination in here. You can't start detailing anything around here. You have to completely give that up. You gave that up the moment you started the silhouette. There is no light on this side to reveal any information and all the light is caught on behind the creature. There's a lot more to do but this is pretty much the basics. I recommend you you kind of, I mean the, if the if the character the character's build doesn't have um, arms because you're the thing is because you're exaggerating the silhouette remember the whole character design silhouette business that I talk about um, because you have actual silhouette and then you have the character design standing like it would it would in a character design setup or lineup and you don't have arms you've made the arms even we've made us miss the arms even more because the character doesn't have arms and they're in a silhouette so the silhouette situation has made the character's arms even more noticeable, like or the lack of arms even more noticeable. So you're going to have to do something about that. If he's supposed to be weird and creepy, he is creeping me out because he's got no arms. I mean, just imagine how he runs. This probably scares the shit out of you if you see this guy running at you in the forest. But if he's supposed to be a good guy, um, I don't know, maybe he had little arms like that. <laughs> or, you know, something like that. You know, a little bit more asymmetrical because there's an abomination or something. I don't know. But uh, the lack of arms, just letting you know, is really noticeable. And then again, subsurface scattering around the fur. Illuminate and saturate. Choose the color. Choose this. The wash is dictating the colors. If he was a blue-green, he's more blue than green because of the wash. The wash isn't allowing any other color in the area. <clears throat> and right around the fur, wherever we get this subsurface scattering, we have to start including some saturation. Except, why would everyone in the chat go crazy about it? Um, yeah, he runs like those flailing guys at car dealerships. Um, is this monster really a dash and stuck in the arm of a sweater? That's all I say. Maybe he has T-Rex arms. <laughs> All right, moving on from the arms. <laughs> let's move on. Let's let's kind of get past the arms <laughs> now. Okay, um, and that's it. These are the changes I recommend. Um, I feel like this is like a. Is it like a marble, like a marble texture? Because if it was, the light would definitely go through this character. 
Um, let me get, grab a good, because it wouldn't just glow like that. All right, I'm going to try to lasso. Wish me luck. 20. There we go. Select inverse. All right. So this this character here, if he's also like a... Oh, come on. If he's also like a... You know, like a weird creature made of weird stuff, and he's illuminated here. Yes, this would also be another situation of subsurface scattering. And it would be this, you know, back and forth between these two focal points. I recommend going in and bringing in more detail around the head because it would be very visible. It's too fuzzy right now. I can't go in myself. And uh, if this was a marble, you really gotta, um, you know, just work, work from a reference. Try to pick up on the light signatures of a marble's texture. And then finally, some of this character here will be slightly in silhouette. Slightly, because the light source is not directly behind them, but above and behind. So just a little bit of extra shadow. And what's this? There's a light source in the area. Where are the shadows cast by that light source? So I'm using the exact color of the light source. The exact light source color. Okay. So when you bring light into this character, when you bring light into all of this, this is what makes your drawings better. This is what takes you from intermediate, from a beginner, out into the world of, of, of professional and advanced. It's that last little 5% that I always talk about. You, you never really pick it up. You never really get to the max, but you're always borrowing from the, from the physical world. You're borrowing from physics to bring life to your painting. You never do 100% realism, do you? You're always borrowing something from it. You don't want 100% realism either because there's a style factor, and which is very debatable, of course. I'm always against the definition of style in people's work. Um, they're more like intentional habits or intentional mistakes made, but as compared to how realistic everything does look. But I'll fix this in a second. The light source brings back the yellow in the green wherever the light source touched the grass, but it's not to this degree, of course. This is, I'm going to be erasing away from this. But you've got his shadow as well. He is in a silhouette, so he's cast, casting a shadow. So you need these shadows. Really, really need them. Your painting is craving them. Cast shadows are very, very important. And what I'm going to do to this selection is just make, you, make it a little bit more blue. Because the filter came first, of course. Saturate make it match the situation around the character. And because it's on normal, I'm going to try to find a alpha. I'm going to try to find a layer mode that lets me use both. Maybe this one right here. Screen. And just like that. And I would bring in more blue and purple in the greens that are under the shadow. So I would again use the eyedropper tool, pick this color and then just shift it over to the blues. And just grab some more saturation and just toss it on the grass. The grass still feels very, very warm compared to everything else. I feel like everything should be monochromatic because look at the trees. The trees have some greenness to them and the, and the green in the trees has been completely removed. So why has the green in the grass remained? Is it like the superior saturation level everywhere? So I'm going to grab this exact color and just run it over the grass one last time. But this is your choice. I really don't think the green would be visible at all if the brown of the trees was not visible. But, um, but if you don't want to go for that monochromatic, you want to break a rule, of course it's been done, you stylistic choice, but you have to remember that it's an intentional break of the rule. In this kind of foggy situation, you don't get that kind of uh, visibility. So, before, after. Let's see what half and half looks like. Before, after. And this is full darkness. Because we're losing some detail. Right? And the reason why I know that it was a silhouette situation is because you had some rim light behind him. This only happens if the light is above and behind. 
and you can have, probably move half in, half out, but I would keep it in this full drama. As for the title, the words, um, they need a bit more, uh, either they, sh they should be in si uh, silhouette as well, which would look, work and kind of complement the... Oy. Complement the um, like the silhouette you had everywhere else, or you just get rid of them for now and just finish the composition and have like a letter artist to take care of that. I think it's much better if the letters are also in a silhouette. Kind of makes it stand out. But these are all just design choices. They they're outside of the physical rules that we work with. Um, for me, I don't really bother myself with font. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm just the artist. I'm here helping you <clears throat> make better choices with your physics and your character design and all that other business. But as for font, you know, there's always artists for that. Okay, this piece right here. Um, great composition. A lot of issues uh, that stem from different other issues. And... Um, I feel like you've maxed out your rendering like power over here and you really need to take a step back a couple breaks from you know a couple months break from masterpieces and do a 14 day challenge that's my professional advice um, what you can do to fix this paint painting in the meantime is address the face it's the face itself is too small for the head and this eye patch has caused the because you have a line here, I'm not sure what came first, the line or the eye patch, but the eye or the eye patch, but the eye is way too small and way too low. So this right here would probably make a little bit more sense. She's a very big woman, but she's got the tiniest little face. And it was like you borrowed like uh, the proportions of a five-year-old and just threw it on a 30-year-old's body this eye patch would work as a substitute for the eyebrow in the meantime it'll still show her sternness and her anger but the way you drew the eyebrow was exactly wrong it was the opposite of what you're supposed to do with the eyebrow you actually went in there and drew a, a sharpie brow which is which is not how we're supposed to be executing these eyebrows the eyebrows are supposed to stay out of the way they don't contest they're very very easily confused with lines and you can fall into that trap very quickly do not draw lines for eyebrows. They're a hair. They are clusters of hair. They're more a, a bush of hair than they are a line. So just go for the bush, okay? Lesson number one. <laughs> Watch everyone quote me on that. Okay, so there's a small amount of you know room for sharpening around the eyebrow, but you really gotta just. Uh, represented as a, as a collection of small hairs, not a single line of, of um, you know, like a single file of, of, of hairs that from a distance read as a pure sharpie line. This is impossible. Unless the person actually went in and, and drew their eyebrows like that, and there are girls who shave their eyebrows off and draw them back on with eyebrow pencil. Google it, and you'll see the realistic equivalent of having those kinds of brows. Her hand is very, very tiny, very tiny talk about the hand in a second. It's a very, very forced, awkward position. Um, again, no reference, and you need, you need to take a moment to perfect your uh, gestures, to work on the gestures. She's looking at a distance. She seems very relaxed, but she's also trying to threaten me. But she's very relaxed while she's trying to threaten me, and I don't feel very threatened. So this is happening because the gaze is, is away, looking at my ear instead of looking me in the eye and intimidating me which is what you want this character to do, intimidate the viewer. There's no expression at all. She looks like she just, um, you know, she has anesthetic. Like she woke up from a surgery. And then I'm just gonna tuck this down. Put the eyebrow down a little bit. And then the position of the nose is too high. This comes, this is why I felt like I was looking at the face of a child instead of the face of a grown woman with double D's. It's because that nose was way too high, my friend. 
way up there. Baby face. That's how you get that baby face. When someone has a baby face, their nose is too high on their head. When the nose is nice and low, you get that age factor. And um, to make her feel a little bit more sinister, you want to take away from the symmetry, but you want to keep her be beautiful, so the symmetry is interrupted with her smile, which has a, just a little bit of madness in it. So I would give a more asymmetrical smile. So let's go back. Before, after. See that? See how tiny that face was? It was like an eight-year-old's face. Or... This is problematic. This is not excusable. This is not something that you should let slide. This is not something that you should say, oh, I'll fix it at the end with Liquify. What happened in your reference system, in your visual library that excused you, that made you think that this this right here was proportionate. <clears throat> okay, so a 14 day challenge will probably help you address some of the major, major anatomical um, issues you're having with portraits. And like I say, you can't just skip portraits as a unit of study. Portraits are the backbone of your port of, of your of your portfolio if you're a character artist. If you can't paint a face, you're really not going to get a job as a character artist, period. I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. You're not going to get a job. And and it's because you you can't you can't you can't just be a boob specialist. You can't just be a, a car, corset specialist. You can't just be a weapon specialist. I mean, maybe that. Maybe maybe a professional at drawing weapons and, and, and drawing them in a studio. And you you know you're working with many 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 uh, artists with different specialties. There's a portrait guy. There's the gesture guy. There's a composition guy. There's the animation guy. And then there's the weapons guy. And then there's the clothing guy. And then there's the uh, there's the after effects with the with the um with the glowy embers guy <laughs> okay but you can't you have to make sure you 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 have the power of portraits in your portfolio if you don't i'm not sugarcoating it for you you will not get hired you need to spend those measly 14 days drawing nothing but portraits and stop trying to push it into a masterpiece to, to salvage what little time you spent in your portrait what you guys do is you draw a portrait one day you're chilling, you draw a point, you're like, shit, I'm going to make a masterpiece out of this. I'm going to bring in some hair, I'm going to bring in some weapons, I'm going to bring in some, you know, I'm going to make her some, I'm going to make her the shit. All right, this is going to be hired for Applebot. This is, this is it, this is it right here. It's just one tiny little frame that you give all of that dress up to. It's like you had a lineup of the most talented singers and you chose the least talented one to put on stage. Why? Why would you take that single frame in your development and highlight it with a masterpiece? You're asking for an, for an ass whooping um, from your viewer, from your director, whatever. If you spend, if you get as many of the bad portraits out of the way, the next time you push something into a full render, it will actually be badass. It will kick ass from the start. There will be very, very little space for critique. All, the, all this portrait has done, all this masterpiece has done is reveal your weaknesses. And that's what I always say, masterpieces have one use, one use only, one, actually two uses if I push it. First use is they teach you how to sit down and, and finish a piece from beginning to end. It's really great, really great talent for you to be able to finish a, a canvas from corner to corner. Fill it up. That's one good thing. The, the, that's, that's, you know, iffy in itself. It'll teach you what you don't know. It'll reveal to you what you don't know how to do. That's the one thing a masterpiece will do. It'll teach you where you got left, what you've got left to study. Okay? You can make the boobs ginormous. You can make them four times the size of her head. It's not going to save the painting. It's not going to save what's happening here. All right? So, so this is another example of I'll never stop. To, I don't care how much hate I get on YouTube. I don't care how many of you don't like the fact that I say stop your masterpieces. I will continue to say it forever because I believe you guys can finish a painting. I believe in you for finishing a masterpiece. Anyone just can sit down and force themselves to finish something. I know it takes a little bit of time, but a masterpiece is easy, relatively speaking. But if you've got a masterpiece and you've got no studies behind that, you're going to give yourself the hardest time in that masterpiece. You're going to hate the drawing process. There's no, there's no system behind the portrait. You're r literally just stabbing in the dark, hoping that something ends up looking good. And I'm not going to hold back. Every time I have a chance to tell you guys to chill out with your masterpieces, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take that chance. I'm not going to hold back. These are this, this, between this, and this is like, what, four, four 14 day challenge submissions? You could have addressed this in a grayscale, no hair, no, no funny business, 
a learning environment and you could have just gotten this mistake out of the way. You could have been at this level along with this level everywhere else. You could have sustained this a consistent level um, in your work. But all this masterpiece did was reveal where your weaknesses are. <clears throat> and if you don't like hearing that, if people don't like hearing that, why are you watching the video? Go on out of here. Get on out of here. If you guys don't like the fact that this is the truth, if you, if you don't like hearing that, then just, you know, move on. If you're a hobbyist, if you are not interested in improving, please move on. Because I wake up every single day to that, well, don't your math stop with the masterpieces. Both videos where I really stress that are the two videos that have been getting the most traffic for some reason. And people are just... They want a piece of me. They want to just like eat me, like they want to kill me or something. And it's just like, dude, just, just, this is the truth. I'm not going to hold back by telling you the truth. If, if it means the truth, if it means some real, real business, real talk to do with your career, this choice that you made that you can never move back from. <clears throat> All right, moving on. Moving on. Um, the, damn it, I've started holding my pen really, really tight because I'm just all pissed off now. <laughs> um, but, uh, right here I'm just gonna get rid of the hand the reason why I'm getting rid of the hand is because what's she doing doing a doing a you know like a, oh my oh oh dear lord it's so hot oh dear lord you know she's doing that whole oh my god it's, it's so hot today she's doing that whole Texan when she needs a fan with her corset and it's really hot in Texas and she's just like a cute little lady who's got ginormous titties and she's just really really hot Oh my God! What's she doing? She's this lady is, is the captain of these sinister-looking motherfuckers. She got there for a reason. She didn't get there being a pretty girl. All right, she didn't get there. Oh my! Oh my! I'm so scared. I'm so scared of these of these pirates trying to trying to siege my 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 ship. Right? She is gonna be. You know, she's ready to scare them. They just pop, hopped on her on her boat, or she just hopped on a boat. She's gonna she's gonna ravage and um and here she is. She's like, yo, I'm gonna kick your ass. If I was about to kick someone's ass, I would not be putting my hand on my chest saying, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. <laughs> okay, I would be like, yo, I'm going to grab your head and I'm just going to destroy it. I'm just going to grab your head and bash it on the floor. So how would I represent that attitude? All right, her attitude is, is saying, I'm going to kick your ass. How do I represent that attitude? Maybe she lost an arm. Maybe this, this arm right here is nothing but a sleeve. All right, I would rather see her arm doing nothing than see it doing this. Okay, so you've got a beautiful piece here. You've got amazing colors, amazing atmosphere. You, it feels like there's rain. It feels like there's a storm all around without you having to draw a single raindrop. You've made it all so, so beautiful, but then you just got her saying, oh, Lordy. <clears throat> um, but yeah. This, the accents are the best. Rude, but on point. Really? How did I achieve to be on point? How did I get the on point without having been rude? So it means that this rude definite, this word rude that you're using really isn't used properly. If the truth means rude, then, then you're not ready for the truth. Come back when the truth doesn't mean rude to you. It means just truth. All right. This is what she reminded. A corset, a pretty little girl face, a round head with lots of feathers. I, it reminds me of like a Victorian or like... Um, uh, like an 1800s kind of kind of kind of daughter of the of of the I'm, I'm, I can't even say it because <laughs> the last time I saw a girl like that was in uh, Django Unchained. So you know she's the daughter of that kingpin, the dude who owns all the slaves. And she's just like it's too it's too hot. I need some iced tea. All right. So if it's rude, get on out of here. I ain't playing princess no more. All right. So I want her hand to be out of the way. She's got like this, this, I don't know, business happening here with her sleeve, a little bit of design and whatnot, just something to fill this space up so it's not empty, it's just not a, nothing but a sleeve, that wouldn't be good. Alright. But yeah, if it's rude, you know where the door is, it's a little X at the top of the screen. But that's the truth. Truth hurts. Truth hurts, man. Okay, so now the focus is back here. The portrait, the typical portrait that we see. I recommend a bit more shadow around her neck just to disconnect the head. I don't think the neck would, would access that much light. It's very, very limited. The light is coming in from a very, very high position. We need to drown her neck in some more shadow so it recedes slowly into the surrounding area. 
half her head needs to be in shadow as well. Again, receding into the darkness behind her, so she seems like she's emerging from it around here. Right, so these are these are the options you have to save your painting. Other than that, it'll always be that one painting that you spent eons on that sets that, that had level one. You know how when you can like max out your skill levels in a game and you can like max out your armor, max out your your archery, max out your sword, play or whatever. Um, but then you like you don't max out one of them and you're just like a, a glass cannon in that respect. Um, um, you can just have that one weak Achilles heel. Your Achilles heel was was this, um, the face and the, uh, the hands and the gesture, and it really stuck out. You put a stage, you put a, you put a, a spotlight on your weaknesses by doing this uh, masterpiece. If you want to undo that, these, this is how you can save it the way I showed you today, but if you want to uh, completely avoid from now on this kind of weakness in your work, then there's only one way, and that's studying. I wouldn't be a teacher if I told you guys not to study, would I? All right, <clears throat> no more fiddling around. I, I really can't decide what else, what else she could be doing with her hand. I have some suggestions, but again, it's your choice as the artist where you want to take this. Um, but it feels like you don't have much of a visual library right now for a variety, like a gesture variety. So it could be that you, you know, need to work on that. She could be holding her sword. Her sword could be almost out. She's ready to attack. Um, this hand is tiny as, as, as fuck. It's just too small. So you need to shrink it, enlarge it. The hand should typically, by gauging it, the hand should be around the size, or the fist should be around the size of, like, the entire face area. Not including the forehead, because that would be too big. But an open hand should cover the whole face. So put your hands on your faces. Um, if you're a girl, your hand is probably much smaller. But if you're a guy, um, or if you're, like, medium, <laughs> what's medium? between a guy and a girl. <laughs> um, like I said, there's only two extremes of the gender, but um, yeah, put your hands on your faces. You see it covers most of your face, so considering that, you don't really need a measurement system or some kind of like measuring tool that you can buy online that, that helps you determine how large the hands have to be. You just gotta look at the head. What did you decide here in mass? Shoulder width, and that should typically be the size of the hand. It wouldn't make sense if we had such tiny hands, we wouldn't be able to carry anything with them or do anything with them if they're that tiny and everything else is developed. So you have that option. If you don't want her to, if you want her to have a little bit more of an elegance in her position, get rid of the other hand motion, but just really you have to enlarge this hand. Um, and that's that. I'm going to flatten that for you. And do one more before and after. Any questions? If you have questions, please write my name so that I can see the question. Um, the waist, you see, this is where it becomes a little bit uh, iffy. The waist, you can get away with it. She's wearing a corset. So let's take a look at what corsets do to human waists, all right? So corset. Let's take a look. All right. It does this kind of stuff. See that the waist, the, the shoulder line is wider than the waistline by like a significant, a massive amount. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is unnatural. Of course, if your painting had this, you would be working from cartoon uh, proportions, with like you know Powerpuff Girls kind of business. Um, but just take a look at what's happening in this waist here. I don't know how she's fighting with this corset. I don't know, but you get away with that because this is coming from a symbol. If you want her to be a little bit more natural, you can widen it a little bit, but you get away with that. See, I didn't even get bothered by that. I didn't even mention that. Uh, breast size, you can get away with it. Width of the of the hips, you can get away with it. But you don't get away with stuff that is anatomically impossible. Not anatomically feasible, just impossible, which is all this business. <clears throat> all right, any more questions? Um, Isabek, how would you approach a foraging date? 14-day challenge on poses. 14-day challenge is just repeating. It, the biggest point of the 14-day challenge is you're repeating for 14 days straight without stopping, using a critique to help you move on to the next day. So without going on to, um, with, before going on to your next gesture that you want to perfect, have someone, um, have someone um, 
you know, critique it for you. Have someone let you know, hey, this is uh, uh, a little bit stiff. You need to have a little bit more of a pronounced gesture. Your the head sizes are completely off. That's how you approach anything that has to do with figure drawing. Is that you have to repeat it and try to repeat the same pose over and over and over and over and over. So repeat after me. To succeed in a gesture, to be able to really perfect your execution of a gesture, you have to draw it more than once. Draw it 10 times. Draw it once every day for 14 days. Draw it 14 days in one day. doesn't matter just as long as you try that gesture more than once because each time that you draw it, you're learning something new. You're remembering something of the process and typically what I always do is gesture comes first, then the shapes, and then the detail. Never, never reverse that order ever because you will end up with a stiff, ugly looking gesture. How can I send you my drawing is to wreck um, <laughs> with the capital. Uh, you can go to my website. I'm not done. I'm going to look at everyone else's work, but you can go to my website, isrec.com, and click on this little button right here, Google Plus. You go here, and you just join and upload your work. Make sure that you follow the rules, read the rules, and make sure you upload in the right category. Isrec, how would you go about creating a female character who is comfortable in her femininity but also holds a high position like a leader? Um, give her all her feminine features. She's got massive hips. Give her massive hips. Sorry, that was my PS4. Um, give her massive hips. If she's got pretty perky lips, give her that. She's still a female, right? But do not make her pose like a pinup. Emmy, if you want to make a powerful looking woman, she doesn't need to attract anybody, right? She doesn't need to use her feminine wiles to, 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 to gain power. She's already gained it. So for a queen to look like a queen, she doesn't just sit there with her legs spread. She has proud shoulders. She has a regal um, distance in her between her head and her shoulders. Very, very long neck. Symmetry. Think symmetry. Don't think lying around waiting to get, you know, um, really, really straight spine, bent forward kind of spine. No, nothing sexual. Remove the sex from it if you want to have a character that looks like she's about power and control. So, um, uh, that's really, like, there's a lot of other sub, sub, ways to do that, but th that's pretty much my, my, my quick tip. Um, please fix the hair before you move on. I, I think, I like the hair. It's big and weird looking, and I, I really like it. This part here gets blurry for some reason, and that's not, that's not right. This is, this distance is the same as this hair, so this wouldn't get blurry without this also getting blurry. That's all I would do about the hair. Um, Okay, any more questions? How would you approach working in challenge? The hat looks like it's floating. Again, it could just be her hairstyle. You get away with massive headdresses, right? You get away with massive headdresses. Remember that. Um, all right, there are plenty of artists out there doing the encouraging kind of false compliment kind of critiques. This rec doesn't, no one forced you to be here. Oh, gosh. <laughs> is there someone <laughs> causing... Um, yeah, the hat is very big, but again, if you guys let's look up some, let's look up some references. Uh, hat headdress. They can get pretty big. They can get like the, the massive ones from the, like the Victorian style ones. Um, I don't know if we can find one like it, but <laughs> what the fuck, Obama. Um, I think that was like a Hawaiian thing. All right, I don't know where to find it. I mean, not, not this to this extremity, but it's like a captain's hat, headdress, something like that. Mm. You get away with all kinds of crazy headdresses. Let me see if I can find an equivalent of that. Um, something like this. But like, uh, see it's kind of just lifted right off her head. I would just leave the hat where it is. In fact, I would make the hat even bigger. <laughs> if she's anything like the cat, the, the, the pirates we know and love from Pirates of the Caribbean, the bigger the hat, the better. The more power they have. Um, let's see, any more questions? Um, ow, ow, ow. <clears throat> uh, Isarak, did you go to art school? If so, which one? I did not go to art school. I studied at home. <clears throat> Isarak, when I do a three-quarter view 14-day challenge, am I allowed to change the angle at which the head is looked at, or is it the same every time? Bioxed, I recommend that it is the same. A 14-day challenge for a three-quarter view is very, very time-consuming and very challenging for a student's ability to rotate an object in space. So you need to stick on, you know, perfect that one single angle. 
Don't try a slightly above the head or slightly worm's eye, slightly bird's eye through quarter view. Use the one that you've studied with, day one, and perfect it. You are not ready to move on to the next one at least uh, until you're like seven days in. And even then, it might not be possible. Even at 14 days, you might not have done enough work to really perfect your 14 day challenge or uh, perfect your three quarter view in that angle. Just take your time. Get Work as much as you can until you feel like you've exhausted all attempts at a three quarter view. At that point, you will have mastered it. Um, that's so cool. And what if, uh, what if got good values but bad composition? How can we deal with it? Composition is about reorganizing your canvas. It's about putting stuff in, in the good position for the eye of the viewer to see and appreciate. So look up some good photography composition. Um, there's always the golden ratio, the Fibonacci. I mean, there's so many different ways to keep the painting organized. Um, but, um, if your values are on point uh, and you have issues with the composition, it means that in your early sketching stage, you really didn't organize your canvas. You just drew wherever you thought it was the first idea. You know, wherever you wanted to draw, that's where you drew first. You didn't think about balancing the canvas. You didn't th think about negative and positive space. So start applying that. Take your time before throwing down your first lines to really address how you're filling up the canvas. How would you suggest moving for a, um, suggest for moving a drawing out of a cartoony stage into a more realistic stage? Um, just as a quick suggestion, um, like for instance, cartoony eyes have less, they don't blink, they can't blink, they don't have an upper and lower eyelid, they have like a really, really symbolic render, even if you used realistic shades and values, um, and colors and realistic skin, for some reason the eyes don't look like they can blink, so think function-wise, that's how you can move from cartoony to realistic, no longer a symbol of the eye, but the functional eyeball in an eye socket type of deal. And that that comes from drawing diagrams. So if you want to perfect it in a study stage, how you would do that is by drawing diagrams of the eye and just continuously drawing diagrams. Draw the eyeball, where the eyelids are, just with pencil so that you can start adding to your brain visual library the underwiring, the foundation shape of the eyeball that can blink. And then when you draw again, when you render again, um, you'll be able to apply that in your shading. So that's a lot of questions. Um, what's the easiest way to spot our mistakes in our drawings? You, it, it, the critique, Dragonska. Uh, she stuff for my studio teacher. What episode of OA are you on? I finished it. I'm so disappointed. Oh my god, I'm so fucking disappointed. I hate what they did with it. I fucking hate that. I wanted to see some glory, but you just end up getting that you know, mediocre stuff. I feel like they had seven different endings and they just chose the one that was most relevant. We, we don't want that. We want to escape. We want the fantasy factor. But I don't want to spoil it for anyone. Um, what's the difference between bad proportions and particular artist, uh, artist style like the wolf guy from the last illustration? What's the difference between bad proportions and particular artist style? Um, I don't think, I think the question should be what's the difference between bad proportions and the d character the, the creature's design, right? Uh, so the wolf's design. Um, if you can get away with it, if you can make it look like the upper part, part of the upper part of the body can be sustained by the length of the legs, then I'm not going to complain about proportion. Uh, as for style, if all the wolves you draw have an elongated shape, then that's a particular choice that you made that you know is not proportionate or realistic that you chose specifically to, to design this character into the way wolves are designed and or animals are drawn in Disney. That's a style. And it's an intentional style. So um, they don't have bad proportions in Disney. They're all proportionate to the style, to the choice, to the habit. Um, I think that's just the only way to think about it, David. <clears throat> um, Mr. Brack, I submitted an image for critique and it hasn't shown up on the community. Is there some kind of submission delay? Yes, there is a spam filter. I'm not sure if there is one right now and, and that's being waited on. All right, so I'm going to go on to the next uh, critique. So I'm still not finished. I have to make up for the amount I've lost this week. <clears throat> so everybody, let's get... That was a 10-minute break. Now everyone, get back to your seats. <clears throat> All right, um... So the Cupid's bow, I just have, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly though, because I can't paint over, um, my hand's starting to get stiff again, uh, but the Cupid's bow here is much too wide, it's, it's as wide as the nose, the Cupid's bow width is the width of the septum, write that back to me, it's not the width of the nose, it's the width of the septum, which is this little dip right here in between the nostrils, 
All right, so that's an issue that came up as a 14-day challenge. You will never have this issue ever again in any masterpiece you draw. You got it nice and out of the way, tucked away, and taken care of. And that's the point of doing studies. You make the mistakes before you're on stage. You'll never make those mistakes on stage. And the masterpiece is the stage. All right, so there are some lips, like those Grecian lips, um, the, 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 you know, those really, really defined Herculean lips, I, I call them, that do have a pretty wide Cupid's bow. So if you wanted the wide equivalent, the realistic wide equivalent, you could have just stretched it a little bit past the septum and made it dip a little bit deeper. Have this tucked in a little bit more, but this time it's not as wide as the nose. So before you had it as wide as the nose, which is not appropriate. And this is with the exception, and then this is with it corrected normally, or normalized, or generalized, or... Okay? Um, the eyes are... the waterline is a little bit large. The eyebrows have no eyebrow bone for the female. It is beautiful. I love seeing an eyebrow that doesn't, that doesn't depend on the arc. But maybe you should try to learn it just a little bit. Um, the nose, you need to study a little bit more on the nose, I think. The nostrils are too small, they're tiny little dots, so that you can avoid radial shading. I don't think you should avoid radial shading. You should really invest in um, a good uh, reference or 14 day challenge so that you can uh, draw a nose that looks like you can breathe. Again, function is the factor that makes it believable. Um, you have an accidental expression here. So if she's like squinting, when I squint, I don't really get an angry look. I kind of get like this upward look in the eyebrows like that. So if the sun is in her eyes and the squint is so much that it feels like there is like a very distinct expression happening. So we need to just chill out the, the face so it reads as a squint instead of like an evil holding back the laughter or you just smell the skunk kind of expression. Because that's when the face really contorts. That's when it, like the, the senses all start to panic in your face trying to... Or the nose is trying to signal to you that there's a bad smell in the area. So if she is squinting, it, this is enough. This is enough of the squint. There's too much of the nostril visible. It feels like the septum is lifted. We're looking at her head from a slightly high angle. The camera is above her head slightly. So that means some of the nostril is going to be hidden. This um, dimple is a little bit too close to the mouth. It needs to be at the center of the cheek, just underneath the cheekbone. That's where dimples usually go. And I'm going to just get rid of that. Smile. This is a front view lip on a three quarter view face. That's problematic. We need to see a three quarter view mouth and three quarter view everything else. So before, after, kind of just tuck that mouth back in. If she did have an, this is why it looks like she has an evil smile, like she just saw her enemy just get killed. Like this is the face of a villain right here. But if she was squinting slightly and just looking forward, um, then I think that's where this should be. And if you had that intention of that expression, it's, even then it feels like... Um, She's squinting and, uh, what's that, what's that word when you, wincing. She's squinting and wincing at the same time. So if you are going for expression, make sure it's intentional, it's not accidental. Don't be an accidental, um, what's, what's the term? Don't be an accidental, uh, prodigy, okay? <laughs> um, oh, she was going for the evil look. Okay, then that, then there it is, then there it is. <clears throat> You wanted to draw a villain, okay. Yeah, so there there you go. It's it was on, on point. It still has that squinty, um, wincy look, but but uh, but you had it. The lip was a little bit still three quarter view, not three quarter view, and the dimple was too close to the mouth. Or the traditional, you know, side full full cheek dimple, not the slight ones on the edges of the lip corners. And then we've got this piece, front view eye, and um side view everything else so um, profile view images do you see what happens when we have what's the difference between this eye and this eye yeah it's a photograph I, uh, whoever said that <laughs> I know that smart ass um, but uh, we don't see the inner corner of the other eye do we 
you're drawing a front view eye. I, I know you're thinking you're drawing a side view, but you're actually drawing a front view eye because we're seeing both corners. The eyeball has a volume to it. It's an actual circle that gets in the way of stuff sometimes. So that means that we will have this eyeball hide the inner corner of the eye if we're looking at it from side view. So everything else doesn't seem to be very problematic. You have a great side view going on. The nose is a little bit small and unusual. and You don't have as much of a dip between the forehead and the nose as you should. And it should be a little bit higher. But the eye is entirely wrong. So you need to start drawing diagrams. It's not just about picking up a canvas and starting to copy a reference. Draw the diagrams of the eye. Draw diagrams. Write that back to me. Please draw diagrams. And then finally, um, this is a really interesting looking loading screen. I mean, this would be a badass loading screen for a game. But is this a candle? And has the candle burned out? I'm, I'm wondering what's happening. If this light is from the candle, then the candle needs to be way brighter than the f whatever it's adding to the objects around it. But if this was just like some light shining through the sea surface, surface of the water and just uh, sneaking in, I recommend you carry it all the way up. Just like that. It's kind of getting like a little sliver of the outer color of the sunlight just hiding in. I think that's beautiful. Just over here. I think that really completes the image. If it was a candle, um, the candle wouldn't really reflect stuff like this. I feel like I'm just dying to see this extend all the way upward. Just having that light shine in. And then you can explain that light with a couple of rays. So soft light. Just having those rays shine in. I don't know which layer mode to use that'll really bring that effect. Probably this one. Just like that. So we've covered a lot of stuff. I'm sorry about how slow I've been, and I'm sorry about the cancellations. It's been a really, really tough couple weeks. <clears throat> And I just, uh, a cherry on top is my hand injury. Just a little bit of rays, just to show that the light is shining through the water. I feel like this is an underwater kind of like a, like an item, item spotlight. Or like a narrative spotlight on the loading screen for a game, which is really badass. I'm just, uh, trying to, remember how I say paint the air? This is like a, an instance where it's not the air, it's the water, but it's still the surrounding atmosphere. But beautiful job on the details. Um, all that looks great. I'm so tempted to just put a glowing <laughs> red dot I'm just looking down at the viewer. But it's going to look so Terminator. <laughs> um, you can make it another color. I feel like red is so, again, so badass, but you can make it like one of these. Like it's a gem, but it kind of looks like it's looking at the viewer. That's your choice. <laughs> I just think it looks cool. It kind of fills it up. So that's my suggestion. Just run that light all the way up across half of the face. Kind of like a person walking through a door. They're in a dark room, but they're walking through a lit door. And uh, you see half their face illuminated. Kind of like that. You're kind of seeing some of the character. And this is like the great skeleton of a dude. But if this was like a concept, I feel like... I don't know what's happening. I feel like there's a story here. It's some kind of like story that you're telling. It feels like an under underwater with all these bubbles. Like an underwater tomb. Some sort of death note afterworld. <clears throat> or like demon realm. Beautiful work. Beautiful work. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining today. Um, and if you guys are interested in the class, there is a website for me, and um, you can go to the website right here, I mean Google Plus, I kind of just zone out at the end, uh, Google Plus, you can join here, the polls are nearly done, um, votes, wait, why doesn't it show me the results, do I have to vote, magical companion. Oh, okay, I had to vote. 
So, um, so yeah, here they are. And uh, it looks like Floral Humanoids has one for our next theme design, which is going to be like, a, you know, if you're new to this, um, I just give you guys a theme, I give you a resource pack to download with a bunch of references, and you submit your referen your work to the images uh, theme submissions category and um, on the due date, and then I feature you on a video. I feature your work, we talk about the character design, what should have been thought about, like what kind of stuff is best, and the displaying this character sp sp according to the specific narrative that I'm going to write for you. It trains you guys to work with an employer, work with a narrative that you're given in the studio or something like that. It teaches you guys how to freelance. It brings more variety to your portfolio. So a lot of benefits come out of the themes. And uh, I promised that I would run a poll for the next one instead of just assigning one like I have been for the last half year. Um, but I um, can't wait to see what you guys submit. And because these didn't win, I will bring them into the next poll. So if you didn't win, you'll probably get... Um, uh, you know, a higher chance of winning if you voted for Magical Companion or Monsters Under the Bed. Um, we'll probably, I'll, I'll run it in the next poll, uh, which is next month. And then finally, the grant scholarship type of deal um, is still open by the end of January. If you want to submit, you get a lot of stuff out of it. The whole, the whole shebang is written somewhere around here. Um, I can't even pin it. I can't pin it at the top because I can't pin more than one announcement. I'm trying to find a way to pin more than one announcement, um, but I, I don't think it's possible. Um, but uh, but yeah, you get a lot of stuff, tablets, uh, sessions with me, um, and a bunch of resources, a copy of Portrait Studio. It just depends on your situation and, and how you display like your art, you know, how, how you want to move along your art career and what you... You know, if you don't have a tablet, if you have a crappy tablet, you want to upgrade. Um, this is an opportunity for you. It's more like a scholarship than a contest. It's not about it's not a matter of who drew best and they get this. I think those kinds of contests suck. Um, but yeah, if you want your work looked at next session, um, just go over here and post your work. Please remember to follow the rules. I upload all these videos on YouTube, so don't forget to like and subscribe. And uh, Facebook, if you have images that you want sent back to you, usually I send them back on Facebook. Um, I do have to tell you guys, you cannot write off my work as your work. So the paint over, if I send you a copy of it, this has been ha this has happened before, you can't say that this is your work if I paint it over it. If I paint over it, that's my work. Um, so if I send you back my copy, please try to reproduce it yourself. Um, if you upload it anywhere, I will be able to tell if you used my work. And then uh, Twitter is where I announce class cancellations, any, any major changes to the class sessions. And then Instagram is just where I post some of my sketches. Um, have a great day, guys. Thank you all for watching today. And I will see you guys on Tuesday next at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Bye, everybody.